Hajas. My name is David Peterson, and this is The Art of Language Invention. Episode 15, Indirect Objects. The prototypical indirect object of a clause is the one that receives a flower in a sentence like, the girl gives the fish a flower. There are a bunch of different types of indirect objects depending on the language and depending on the verb, but what I want to focus on today is how indirect objects are marked because there are a bunch of different ways that they can be marked and usually we only think of like one or two or three of them. A couple bits of important information before we get started. Uh, a lot of this information is coming from a paper called Clause Types by one of my heroes, Matthew Dreyer. Uh, it's uh, one section of a much larger paper, but if you're interested in reading it, and I recommend you do, it's really, really great, uh, you can go ahead and download it here. Gonna, I'll figure that out later. I'm just recording right now. Anyway, um, so all of the information I'm about to give is going to be done in just like a little uh, made-up toy language that we're going to use for this video. Uh, but there are real-world examples that you can find in Matthew Dreyer's paper. For our purposes, we need something a little simpler just to demonstrate what's going on. So I want to introduce you to the following terms that I'm going to be using throughout the rest of the video. So here are some words. Uh, first, we have uh, kitty, which means girl. Niwa, which means fish. Luni, which means flower. Mai, which means give. To, which means pat. Po is one type of preposition. Sa is another type of pre preposition. And then we have three suffixes, an n suffix, a z suffix, and a k suffix. These things are going to be getting meanings uh, depending on the sentence that we're looking at as we are moving along. Uh, but we need to have some sort of material there just to get an idea of what we're doing. All right, so let's start with the easiest type of uh, indirect object marking, the one that uh, everybody knows probably who's uh, watching this video, uh, the, the way that indirect objects are marked in English. Uh, to start off, we need a control sentence. So, for example, Giri tolniwa, girl pats the fish. Uh, so that's a transitive clause where we have the subject on the left, the object on the right, the verb in the middle, uh, no marking for any of them because this is like English. Um, if that's a transitive clause, this is a ditransitive clause. Kiri mai niwa luni. The girl gives the fish a flower. Notice that the flower is last. The fish is directly in between the flower and the verb. And of course, the girl is still first. Uh, this is because indirect objects go directly after the verb in English. In fact, if you flipped the order to the opposite order, uh, luni niwa, it would actually mean the opposite thing. The girl gave a fish to the flower, which is just ridiculous. You give flowers to fishes, not fishes to flowers. That's the way the world works. All right, um, and of course, in English, there is one other thing you can do if you really need uh, for the uh, indirect object to be out of the verb structure. You can kick it out of the verb uh, structure where it becomes part of a prepositional phrase. So in our in our little toy language, that would be uh, uh, The girl gave a flower to the fish, where sa is acting just like two. So those are our first three strategies. We can do it just like English where you can either do it with a word order or with a prepositional phrase. Um, preposition in this language, because we're using prepositions, but of course, if your language is postpositions, it'll be postpositional, whatever. Um, so that's one strategy. Another strategy is to do it just with or word order. And then a third strategy is to do it just with add positions. So that's uh, three strategies so far, the first three. Now let's move on to things that are a little different from English. Next, we can do something a little like Latin, where we basically have three different cases to mark the three different roles. So our control sentence is niwan. Here we have an N suffix on the end of niwa, uh, fish, and it's acting like an accusative suffix. This is the girl pats the fish. Now for, I, for our ditransitive sentence, giri my niwa's lunin. Here we have uh, the introduction of a new suffix, the Z suffix. It's acting like the dative suffix and the N suffix is still acting like the accusative suffix. Uh, typically in a language like this, you can uh, mix up the order if you want. So kiri mai luni niwas wouldn't mean anything different. It would still mean uh, the girl 
gives a flower to the fish or the girl gives the fish a flower, same thing. Um, but uh, usually there's a preferred word order that is more natural. Um, but, uh, but, but realistically, flipping them up shouldn't make a difference. So you can do that with uh, case inflections, or you can also do the same thing with uh, ad positions. So with ad positions, the example would be uh, Kirimai poluni saniwa. Uh, two prepositions here, two different prepositions, one that marks the direct object and one that marks the indirect object. So that gives us our next two marking strategies. Uh, strategy four, uh, marking all three roles with case inflections, or strategy five, marking uh, the relevant roles with ad positions, whether it's all three or just two of them, with the, with the other one being unmarked. Um, these should be fairly familiar. Now we're gonna move on to ones that may be a little less familiar. The following strategy is really interesting and also really alien to a lot of the languages that you might be familiar with. So to start off, let's, let's look at a control sentence. Kirito uh, niwa, exactly like English. No marking, word order tells you who does what to whom. Now let's look at the ditransitive sentence and see what happens. Kirimai niwa lunin, the girl gives the fish a flower, or the girl gives uh, uh, a flower to the fish. Uh, notice what happened in this sentence. It's very similar to maybe a, a different type of sentence. You might say, okay, whatever, there's, there's no marking here. Uh, there's just a dative case. But that's not actually what's happening. There is case marking, and it's an accusative case. But that accusative case only appears when there is an indirect object present. This is what Matthew Dreyer calls uh, primary object and secondary object marking. So he wouldn't call the suffix here, he wouldn't call it an accusative marker because it doesn't appear in the first sentence. Remember that had no marking at all. He calls it a secondary object marker. Uh, his idea is that essentially in a ditransitive clause, um, the recipient is the primary object of the verb. It's the more important object. That is, who, who is the recipient of the giving is more important. Um, the uh, thing that is actually given is less important. And so it's marked with some sort of case and put at the end. Um, so that's actually what ha what's happening here. It's not that direct objects are marked. Uh, direct objects are only marked in these ditransitive clauses where there is a more important object that gets the, in this case, uh, non-marking, uh, gets the unmarked role. Um, naturally, of course, you can do this with case inflection or you do it with an ad position, such as giri mai ni wa poluni, mean the same thing, uh, it just depends on how it's marked. So that, uh, this gives you our sixth and seventh strategies uh, for marking indirect objects. That is, um, no marking at all, unless there's a ditransitive verb, in which case the direct object gets marking, um, either with a case inflection or with an ad position. So that is our sixth and seventh strategies. Now let's move on to a different one. This strategy is a little interesting and also not uh, super common. Let's look at our test, uh, our test, uh, our control clause. Kirito ni one, the girl pats the fish. Again, this is exactly like our Latinate example above. Uh, we see the direct object getting an accusative marker and the uh, subject not getting any marking at all. Um, now let's look at the ditransitive clause. Giri mai lunin ni wan. Notice what happened here. There's no dative in this at all. Instead, both the direct object and the indirect object get the exact same marking, this accusative marking. It's essentially saying there are two objects for this verb. Um, if you're going to have a language like this, it seems likely that you will have um, word order determine which is which. Um, but I could see a situation where, for example, context would determine. Um, because, like, you know, for example, usually it's pretty obvious who the recipient is and what the direct object is in one of these clauses, like a giving clause. Because, I mean, as, as we've already established, I mean, in no possible world is somebody giving fish to a flower. I mean, you only give flowers to fishes uh, to honor them. Uh, that's the whole reason we have flowers and fish. It doesn't go the opposite way. So there, you know, context would help you out, but uh, presumably word order is probably the way that you determine which is which. Um, naturally, of course, you can do this with case inflections 
or you can do it with add positions and then that gives us our eighth and ninth marking strategies that is both objects get accusative marking uh, either with a case inflection or with add positions all right for our 10th 11th 12th 13th 14th and 15th marking examples we're basically going to take some of the ones we have already seen but take them out of the nominative accusative uh, spectrum and plop them into ergative absolutive languages so it's the same stuff you've seen only the marking differs a little bit so for our first example kiriktolniwa here we have the introduction of the k suffix which is going to be our ergative suffix so the agent gets marked with k and the patient gets marked with nothing. It's in the absolutive case or unmarked case. So that's our control sentence. Now for our ditransitive sentence, kirik my niwas luni. This is basically like our Latin example. We have an unmarked case, a marked case, and then a dative case. So our dative case is the Z, and then our marked case is the ergative that is attached to the subject. Our unmarked case is the uh, absolutive object. Um, so very similar to the Latin one, just ergative absolutive alignment. Um, so one strategy is to do that with uh, case inflection, another with add positions. So those are our 10th and 11th strategies. Next, we have our secondary object strategy. So this is the one that uh, that is a, a little out there compared to what we're used to. So. Our control sentence is again, uh, still uh, ergative marking on the agent there. And then our ditransitive sentence is, uh, my niwa lunin. What happened here is that um, niwa didn't change its marking, it's still getting absolutive, but it changed its role. It's no longer the patient, it's now the recipient. It's still unmarked though because it's considered to be the most important object in the ditransitive clause. Instead, the uh, patient gets some marking, some different case, in this case we used our, our N there, uh, letting us know that it is the uh, secondary object in a ditransitive clause. And again, still the agent has ergative marking. So then that is our uh, 12th strategy. And then our 13th strategy would be doing all of that with add positions. Now for our last strategy, it, this is basically the uh, same marking for both objects. So our control, kiriktolniwa, again, still ergative for, for kiri. And then for the ditransitive clause, um, kirik my niwa luni. Both uh, fish and flower get absolutely no marking at all, meaning they're in the absolutive, and word order is there to determine um, which one is the direct object and which one is the indirect object. Uh, so that is our 14th strategy, and again, the 15th would be doing that with add positions instead of case inflection. That's not every possible strategy for marking an indirect object, obviously, but these are the ones that we find occurring in natural languages. Um, you probably knew some of them, maybe some of you knew all of them, but hopefully if there are some of you that did not know all of them, now you do, and you can just add them to your bag of tricks when it comes to determining how grammatical relations are marked in your conlang. That's it for this episode. If you have a question you'd like for me to answer on the show, leave it in the comments or send me an email at djpquery at gmail. Com. If you want to see more videos like this one, feel free to subscribe. Thanks for watching.